If you white folks want to be treated the way blacks are in this society, stand. Nobody's standing here. That says very plainly that you know what's happening. You know you don't want it for you. I want to know why you're so willing to accept it or to allow it to happen for others. I want to tell you guys a story. This story is about my father and my mother. Now as I tell this story, I'm going to put my mom on the phone so that she can explain in her own words as well what happened. Hey. Hey. So for those of you guys who don't know, my father is black and my mother is white. Now there was this one time when my dad was going to the grocery store. It was in the evening. He paid for his groceries, gets in his car, drives home. And not too long after he gets home, he's with my mom and they're kind of relaxing, unwinding after a long day. It was at night. It was dark outside. I remember that. All of a sudden the backyard just swarms with these bright, swirling, flashing lights, lighting the entire backyard and spilling into the house along with it came this just this really loud droning sound and they realized that there is a helicopter directly above their house the entire backyard was all lit up like it was broad daylight and we could hear the sound of a helicopter out there now mind you this is a neighborhood where you never see helicopters they just this is not something that happens here and then suddenly they hear this this pounding on their front door and they realize that the police are at their house. Uh, I go to the front door and open it and there's seven or eight cops out there and I was shocked. I, what in the world are they doing here? What did they want? Now you can imagine how stunned she is at this point. The police officer in charge pushes his way into her house. You know, kind of just muscled his way in and kind of pushed me back. And I thought it, it made me kind of angry. Why is he just pushing his way in? And they ask her, who are you? Do you live here? And she says, yes, this is my home. I live here. Now at this point my dad who's in the kitchen watching the flashing lights comes around the corner and the police officers the moment they spot him they look to my white mother and ask her who is he? And I said it's my husband and he said um, okay well he's gonna have to show his ID. Did the police ask you for your ID? No they didn't. They never asked me uh, to prove who I was. My dad says to the officer, Sir, I keep my ID in the car. So some of the officers follow my dad to the car. The rest of the officers stay in the house with my mom. So at this point, my mom asked the officer, What is this all about? What, what's going on? You know, what, why are you here? And he goes. And the officer tells her, There was a phone call report that came in that somebody heard the sound of breaking glass. <laughs> And I said, well, there hasn't been any glass breaking. Now the officers, while they're talking to her, are looking around. They're just looking around. And then all of a sudden, he saw this photograph of, of your dad on the wall and uh, said, oh, I see, I see he lives here. You know, I'm thinking, well, yeah, I told you he was my husband. And the officer tells my mom that they had no way of knowing if he was an intruder. He said, you know, we, we don't know if... Uh, you're being pressured uh, or threatened in some way to say that. They, they just, just assumed, assumed that you rightfully belonged there, but that... But that he probably didn't. And that he must have vandalized or broken in and was potentially holding you hostage. Or he had threatened me in some way. So my dad is at his car with the other officers. One of the officers tells him, okay, go in your car and get your ID. So he very calmly tells the officer, sir, I do not feel safe getting into my car. Knowing that that would be a very dangerous thing for him to do, said to the cop, no, I'm not going to get it. You get it. And I think about that time the other officer came out and said it's okay. Then they all left. So after the police leave, my parents go inside the house. They don't even know if that was a false report, that perhaps it came from a neighbor who had a problem with there being a new black man living in the neighborhood. Probably someone didn't like seeing 
a black man in the neighborhood. Or perhaps there wasn't a phone call at all. Perhaps my dad was followed from the grocery store. They don't know. We don't know that anybody called anybody because of his skin color. I don't know what to think. But what they did know is that a police helicopter blasted lights over their home, seven officers pushed their way inside the house, and questioned whether or not my father belonged there. Our first inclination was to go outside and see what was going on, and he felt that if he had gone outside, uh, he might have gotten shot. The thing is, these stories are mild in comparison to the black people who are tortured, who are attacked, who are losing their lives on camera. Not to minimize my own experiences, because it is experiences like the ones that my family has had that has contributed to this ongoing layer upon layer upon layer of systemic racism and prejudice. It is then these disgusting, violent acts against innocent black lives that are the catalyst and the tipping point for the things that we are seeing right now. What we are witnessing is not only a lifetime, but 400 years worth of lifetimes of calculated evil oppression. We are not safe in our own homes. We are not safe in our own skin. This is nothing new. We just have cameras that are capturing some of it now. So people are being forced to realize that this is the reality that black people in this country have faced since the very beginning. I can't breathe! I can't breathe! Let me say this clearly. I can't breathe. We can't breathe. That's not a chip on my shoulder. That's your foot on my neck. This is not just a black problem. This is a human problem. Injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. Just stop killing us. Stop villainizing us. It's hard to explain what it feels like to be so hated for your color. It feels like from birth that your life is placed on top of this house of cards while others have their feet placed firmly rooted on the ground. And at any moment in time, simply for the fact that they were handed a solid foundation, could huff and puff and they could blow your house of cards down, whether it's your humanity, your rights, your freedom, or your life. That for every step you take to build solid footing on this shaky ground, someone else may be taking calculated steps in order to weaponize their privilege to take you down. I look at the woman in Central Park, for example. She knew exactly what she was doing. She was weaponizing her privilege and leaning into a system that is supposed to protect innocent lives, but has systemically threatened the lives of black people. The thing is, our national anthem is not the same on this house of cards. One nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. But we have largely been collectively excluded as a community from that liberty and justice for all for 400 years. Our history has been largely nothing but divisible, divided from our homes, divided from our families, divided at our schools, divided at our jobs, divided on film, divided on media, divided from our friends, even those who publicly say that they are on our side for posterity, but privately say and act very differently. If I decided to have a child, I still have to reconcile with the fact that because of the skin that I live in, my child would face unspeakable, ingrained, gaslit oppression simply for the fact that she came from my body. My child would be born onto a house of cards. For years, I was conditioned to see myself as less than, and I didn't even realize this because, you know, I'm a kid growing up, you don't know that this is happening to you, and it's this ultimate form of gaslighting of black people. Now, because of this, I didn't often talk about my color, number one, because I had been conditioned to believe that I was inferior, number two, to not draw extra attention to my color by speaking about it. One entire half of my family is 
white and one entire half of my family is black. I've had a very unique experience and look into both sides of this spectrum and I see firsthand the privilege that the white side of my family has been given and I see the oppression that the black side of my family has been given. I also see the kindness on both sides. So I am literally a living, breathing example that black and that white can coexist in peace and harmony. But it's going to take a lot of work, especially on the side of those who have been handed privilege so that black people are no longer oppressed. Now I do know that there are white and non-white people who have felt like that somehow they're not saying the right things. With change is going to come adversity. With change is going to come attack from people. To expect that yes, some people are not going to like it, but that does not mean that you should stop. Black Lives Matter! Black Lives Matter! I want to mention this idea about the token black. I think we've all probably heard that expression at one point. It's this idea that in a white group of friends, they will have one black friend, the token black. That in films and TV shows, which have historically largely been cast with predominantly white casts, they will throw in there one token black. I've been called that in many, many undiversified circles. But there have been times where the token black friend has become the scapegoat, often using it as an excuse to continue to irresponsibly use their privilege by saying, oh, I'm not prejudiced, I work with a black person. Oh, I have a black friend, so I don't need to speak up. Look at the definition of a token. In general, a token is an object, a piece resembling a coin issued for use by a particular group on specified terms. We are not your token currency that you pull out of your pocket anytime you need to pay the accountability toll for your actions. Now, I posted recently on Twitter about another divide that I face, and that's between between my white and non-black influencer friends and peers. And I continue to be grateful and thankful to anyone who is posting out of a genuine place. Now to the other side of this is something I've witnessed that is far more hurtful, at least for me, in that I have seen some white influencers, people that I know personally, who are posting very publicly in support of black people and minorities, but I know for a fact privately have said very prejudiced things behind closed doors. I have had a white influencer friend and tell me bigoted, oppressive things. Tell me that I should be grateful for the opportunities that they are being handed to me and that it is so much more difficult for a white creator and that white people have it much harder. And the same person turns around and posts about what a great ally they are for black people and an ally they are for minorities. Thus making us their token that they can pull out of their pockets to appear to look like they are on the side of equality. To me, that feels like they are using our trauma and our our experiences for their own public gain. It puts me in a difficult position where on one hand people say, well, just be grateful and thankful for what you get, that they're using their platform right now in this moment while everything is trending in order to be in support. It hurts a lot and I just can't do it anymore. George Floyd! George Floyd! We must find a way to love and accept and cherish every single color that is living on this planet because this hate, this intolerance is unacceptable. I can't breathe. We can't breathe. Eric Garner, Breonna Taylor, Trayvon Martin, Ahmaud Arbery, George Floyd, and countless others, your lives matter, your dreams matter, your hopes matter, black lives matter. We demand the right to live in our own skin without being afraid of our lives being cut short. It takes every single color on this planet to change this system. To all my black people out there, you are beautiful, you are powerful, and you are worthy. 
You are worthy of happiness. You are worthy of peace. You are worthy of justice. You are worthy of your skin. You are worthy of your color. You are worthy of your family. You are worthy of your education. You are worthy of your success. You are worthy of your dreams. You are worthy of your challenges. You are worthy of your humanity and you are worthy of your life. Don't you ever forget that.